everyone. Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, I'll just go through a couple of bits before we start. Um, health and safety wise, um, obviously we're still in COVID restrictions. Um, whilst masks aren't mandatory, we advise them. And if you could adhere to your social distancing. Um, and in case of emergency, the gathering point is out in the car park. Um, as you'll see, we're filming the event tonight. That's just so that anybody that wasn't able to come because they didn't have their vaccine passes is, is able to watch it at a later date. If you don't want your photograph taken or you don't want to be on camera, please let myself or Martin know and we will make sure that you're not included in anything. Um, so I'll just introduce myself. My name's Joe Fern. I work for Ellesmere Sustainable Agriculture as the Tanaku Extension Project Coordinator. Ellesmere Sustainable Agriculture is a farmer-led group who received funding through MPI and the Jobs for Nature program in October 2020, and that led to the establishment of the Tanaku Project. The aims of the Tanaku Project were to increase um, creating jobs, enhancing biodiversity and Mahinga Kai values, and also improving water quality in the area. The Jolly's Brook Fish Passage Project started when David Hewson and Joanna Blakely who both worked for the Tanaku project, did some work on Lindsay Gilbert's property. Um, the project were funding a restoration project on um, Tim's farm, sorry, not Tim's farm, Lindsay's farm, um, along the Jollies Brook there. And he had expressed the desire to open up a, a passage so that native fish could re-enter Jollies Brook. Currently, the only access is through a culvert on the beach that often blocks and so, um, native fish can't get through. Um, Tim Ridgen, another local farmer, had similar ideas. He too has carried out extensive work on his property and would like to see the wetland extended and allow fish access. So in July 2021, I came on board with, and my first task was to write a submission to ECAN to apply for some funding through their regional fish habitat fund. At this stage, the project is just a concept. It's just an idea by local landowners, um, which we thought would be a good idea. Um, and so the application for the funding was just to apply for funding to get a feasibility, stu feasibility study done to make sure that the project's actually going to work if we move to the next stage. Um, it's very important that we have the public here tonight and local landowners and other interested parties so that you can have your input. That's why we're welcoming you here tonight. Patel Delamore Partners were chosen to carry out the feasibility study and so tonight we have Laura Drummond here who's a senior ecologist. Um, we've also got Winsome Marshall who's on Zoom who <laughs> she did lead the feasibility study but unfortunately she's quite heavily quite. pregnant and so couldn't be here tonight, but she is listening in and she'll be available to answer detailed questions at the end. And we've also got Hamish Peacock here who is the um, a lead planner. So they're going to discuss their findings and the plans. And then after we've heard from them, then we'll have the opportunity to ask some questions and comments. So I'll hand over to you, Laura. Thanks, Joe. So yes, uh, as Joe said, I'm Laura. I'll just be presenting what we've done so far. So our overall kind of aims, uh, the studies we've done and where we're hoping to go. Uh, as Joe said, this is very preliminary and we'll be doing a lot of consultation, but wanted to get the landowners and um, the local input first. There's also a couple of concept plans just down there on the wall that you can go have a look at after the presentation and we can talk about it. The one on the left is basically the current state of what the area looks like and the one on the right is is, is basically a, a pie in the sky, what could it be? What could we do to enhance this area? Uh, not final by any means, but really just concepts of what we could do and really interested in all of your input on what you would like to see. So I'll just run through some slides. Hopefully everyone can see the presentation and just let me know if, if you need me to talk louder or uh, slow down. So as Joe said, we were engaged uh, by ESI to look at the feasibility of connecting these habitats. Uh, funding was from Environment Canterbury, uh, from the Regional Fish Habitat Fund. Uh, so currently Jolly's Brook flows down and into a hapua, it's quite an extensive hapua, and it's supposed to discharge out through the gravel bar, through a culvert, but it gets blocked up very frequently by the wave action filling it with gravels. So there's currently no reliable ingress or egress for fish. So the native fish that are in the catchment, like the longfin and shortfin eel that need to migrate out to sea, currently have limited ability to do so. When the, the hapua fills up, it can become a flooding risk. 
so the uh, culvert is manually cleared and water comes out, but that's a, a health and safety issue as well of working in such a dynamic environment and it's not a reliable way. The, the hapua then drops dramatically in water level and then becomes uh, isolated again. So we've done some high level ecological surveys of the area just to look at what's currently there and what could be there and also a planning assessment to look at what would be required moving forward. So just so you guys get an idea of where we're, you know, the area we're looking at, and it's a bit clearer in the concept maps, we've got Jolly's Brook here, I'm not allowed to touch the <laughs> thing, we've got Jolly's Brook here on the right coming down, you have the Hapua going along there, you can see where the yellow uh, dots are, those are just some locations we did fishing surveys for context. I don't know if you can see the orange line coming out on the beach, that's the blocked culvert location. And then down there is the Rakaia Lagoon. The area where we have that blue polygon is where there is no connection between those two water bodies. So we have water coming all the way down in a big wetland, and then we have a break, and then we have Rakaia Lagoon. So that's the setting. And just to give you guys a, a bit more of an idea of how that looks, I've just got a wee drone footage that was done by the team just showing it. So here we're down at the Jolly's Brook end, just flying down towards Rakaia Lagoon and it just gives you a bit of an idea of the scale of what's there and the condition of it. So you've got lots of rapo beds and wetland habitats. You've got some little backwaters where water pools during rainfall events. And then you have a berm and then the beach to the left. You can see some birds down there in the, in the wetland. It's well used by bird life. So this is where the connection is still going. So you have water coming all the way down here through the wetland complex. And then just up here you can see where there's land and we don't have that connection. section where we have a little bit of a, a dip but no connectivity with water. So the, the main questions we asked were what the regulatory framework is, is for this type of activity, uh, what are the existing and predicted, what are the existing habitats and ecological values and what would the impacts of this proposal do? And then looking at long-term sustainability, so flooding and sea level rise. Okay, Hamish, you'll never. Thanks. So for this feasibility study, um, essentially the regulatory framework, we looked at this uh, the policy documents that we checked through um, and obviously a couple there are relatively new I'll talk about those in a bit in a, in a minute but basically it was a snapshot looking at well what are the rules what are the things that we would contravene in doing the works to establish um, the project conceptually both from a um, establishment phase a construction phase and then an operation and maintenance phase um, because they're quite different things if you're thinking about the whole project in its totality um, and the key drivers here, I guess, are um, the Regional Council's framework in terms of the, the Regional Policy Statement, the Land and Water Plan, um, the Air Plan, um, and the Coastal Plan, um, as well as the National Policy Statements and the National Environmental Standards for Freshwater, which are relatively new, and some of those provide a, a pathway or provide greater guidance around restoration projects, um, which is helpful, because uh, with the driver of maintaining and enhancing water quality, they had to address provisions around restoration or um, enhancement projects, essentially, for water quality drivers. Um, also, Selwyn District Council's district plan for the land use type of activities, whether that's vegetation clearance within proximity to waterways or, or earthworks. Um, 
The one thing that isn't listed there is um, possibly the Wildlife Act. So if you were doing any disturbance or threatening any um, threatened species, potentially there, there could be also permits required under that. Okay. Whoops. Oh, you went too far. So that gave us a big list, um, which I won't read through it, but it, it itemises um, all the different things under the Act, from typical things which could be dam and divert of waterways, mixing of waters, um, take use dam or divert, discharge of, of waters or contaminants, um, particularly for the construction phase. Um, but section 13 and 14 manners and 12 um, all come into play in terms of the works that we're with in the coastal marine area um, on the coastal margin, um, the use of, of riverbeds, um, where you're erecting structures in, in them or doing damming or diversions. Um, and also the National Environmental Standards, um, which, which include those rules from the NES expected to be adopted into the Regional Council planning framework, um, which is quite critical in terms of whether you're damaging, destroying or disturbing um, plants or parts of plants or exotic um, or indigenous species. Um, and e equally the NES uh, for freshwater in the way it addresses the works that you might do in proximity or around or through wetlands. Um, so that gave us, um, sorry, other matters it covered, I did mention wildlife permits there, but um, archaeological authority, so under the Historic Places um, Act, um, whether you require consents under those which, whether you're uncovering artefacts um, or damaging your heritage items uh, may require consents. So what we knew is there's a whole bunch of permits and consents required and we didn't want to dive so deep into detail into every last component, but just about managing the expectation of how challenging that regulatory pass or regulatory test would be. Um, and also bearing in mind that the staging or the delivery of when the job's done and when the consenting phase actually kicks in may look slightly different to this because with, with um, change in statutes under the uh, Natural and Built Environment Act, um, the um, Strategic Planning Act, the Climate Change Act, um, all see a different framework. But I'm sure, um, well certainly Minister Parker has given us a pretty good indication that there'll be somewhere between seven to ten years of transitioning from what we currently do, deal with in this framework and what it'll look like under those new bits of legislation. But it really that list um, is kind of the expected consents and gave us an idea of how hard that would be to consent or uh, what things we'd need to do in terms of the studies, the designs that can inform how to mitigate effects. So our planning findings, um, obviously there's a wide range of consents required and some of them require detailed studies to support those consents. Um, some of them require more detailed or conceptual designs given that we're only a feasibility phase. We didn't have a lot of information about design of structures or hydrology, modelling, uh, connectivity between coastal water and freshwater. We didn't we knew conceptually what was going to happen, but we didn't have the, the, the degree of detail to um, do a more thorough assessment, but that wasn't the purpose of it. It was really to um, manage people's expectations about kind of the consenting requirements. With any consents, a significant amount of consultations required, and that's why we're here tonight, to kind of get some thoughts and feedback um, from people. But particularly with EWI, um, both councils, landowners, and there are a number of other potentially affected parties that will take interest, whether that be DOC, Forest and Bird, um, Fish and Game, others. Um, I've already mentioned a little bit about the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management and um, the National Environmental Standards for Freshwater. They do, they've raised the bar and brought a different uh, focus to the way we manage um, water resources and wetlands um, and waterways. Um, so that's quite important and particularly the provisions in the NES around um, you know, enhancements that can be made through projects like this is quite encouraging that there is a pathway. So we're, we're pretty optimistic that those pathways allow, while there's lots of consenting requirements, allow a, a fairly high level um, strategic piece of work uh, to guide this project. Yep, I've talked a little bit about that last point. I think the key thing though is that going through any of these planning assessments, every time you do it, you come up with ideas and thoughts about how could we better mitigate? How could we better design? What are the things do we need to consider in terms of impacts on landowners? or affected parties or certain ecologies that we can adapt. And so we've taken a pretty open mind about capturing stuff out of the planning assessment about that's clearly a, 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 a direction that we've got to take about how do we design to, to mitigate those effects or how do we design to remediate the situation 
of um, adverse effects have been occurring. And that's probably the best way we can actually uh, move forward conceptually on this project is um, thinking about, well, how does it look and feel in terms of the final um, product? Back to me. So I think I'm back to you, Laura. Yep. <laughs> So for the kind of initial ecological investigations, we did a, a desktop study and also some field studies as well. So for the desktop study, we looked at all the known resources for the area. So that included the Canterbury maps layers for biodiversity and ecology, the freshwater fish database to see what's historically been in these areas, and then also the fish passage tool just to look at where the barriers were in the system. We also looked at lots of different reports on Jolly's Brook and the Rakaia Lagoon. Oh, went too far. So what we found out from that is that the area at the base of Jolly's Brook, that, that Hapua Lagoon, is classified as a wetland. It's classified as two different types of wetlands on the Canterbury maps layers. So one, one of them describes it as a dune back, uh, back swamp and the other an estuarine salt marsh, palestrine salt marsh, and a, a threatened habitat. So this area provides, is known to provide feeding for a wide range of birds, and it's a really great habitat. It's not recognised as supporting any threatened bird species, though, but we would need to do a formal uh, bird survey to confirm that. That's just what's on the desktop layers. So... Oh. Have I gone too far? Sorry. Nope. Okay. So historically, Jolly's Brook and Rakaia Lagoon were likely connected, and that can be confirmed <laughs> by some um, old imagery that we have. When you look at the Canterbury black maps, you can see that the system was connected from Rakaia Lagoon up to Jolly's Brook. Uh, a lot of fish have been recorded, a lot of native fish have been recorded in the Jolly's Brook catchment, including lamprey, which are a threatened species, longfin eel, upland bully and brown trout but it has a high risk level for inhibiting uh, migration of these fish in and out, and that's the, the, um, culvert, the block culvert that we're referring to. And then in 2021, a study was done by ECAN that we worked on where we did some fish surveys of the actual Rakaia Lagoon, and we found 11 native species of fish and two exotic species, so a lot of fish life in that lagoon that could be utilising this Hapua and Jolly's Brook. So here's some imagery from those Canterbury black maps. Hopefully it's not too small for you guys to see, but you can see that once upon a time there was a lagoon, which is the, the blue, the dark blue, which went all the way down from Jolly's Brook, which is this uh, larger area up on the top right, all the way down. It had some back swamp areas and areas where there was some wetlands and then came down, had a thin connection through the sand hills and went into Rakaia Lagoon. So that's the, the overall concept of what we're looking for here is how to connect it back to what it once was. And just those fish that we were talking about that have been caught in the, in the lagoon, we're talking about lamprey, which are a threatened nationally vulnerable species, longfin eel, which are considered at risk and declining, upland bully, which are not too threatened, they're pretty common, and also the brown trout, which is introduced and naturalised. There used to be brown trout, quite a lot of them, in Jolly's Brook, but there haven't been any recorded for quite a while. And then in the Rakaia Lagoon, there was common bully that were caught, enunga, quite a lot of enunga that weren't caught in the Jollies area, common smelt, black flounder and um, mullet. So quite a, quite a diverse fish life in this system. We also looked at pest plants. We did a high level pest plant survey of the lagoon area. This wasn't incredibly detailed and we would have to do a threatened species uh, survey just to make sure there wasn't anything in the area that needed extra protection. But two potentially problematic uh, wetland plants were found, this Elisma, which is the one up here, and yellow flag iris. They're not uh, pest plants per se, but they're, they're damaging for the ecosystem and they can take over native uh, habitats, which we don't want, especially the rapo beds. And then uh, within the drier areas that weren't considered wetland areas, we found quite a lot of bramble, gorse and uh, willow, which would be good to manage those as well. And this is just the areas where they were found. So the, the kind of purpley was where the elisma was found and the yellow flag iris was in an area by the, the uh, culvert that's connecting Rakaia uh, up to the right there. So just very small areas. There wasn't, wasn't a huge amount of uh, these pest plant species, but we're just flagging them for remediation. Okay, then we did an enunga and smelt spawning survey. It's a bit of a mouthful. 
uh, looking for potentially suitable habitat in this lagoon area for inanga because they're quite specific in where they like to spawn. So inanga are the juvenile whitebait species. So we're looking for areas where they like to spawn in the kind of salt wedge. So they, yeah, they like to uh, spawn in the bankside riparian vegetation, which is why these hapuas are often really great uh, habitat for them to spawn and then sp smelter spawning in the sandbars, which isn't really the, the habitat that we have in Jolly's Lagoon. There we go. So no smelt, smelt habitat was found at all in the survey, but potentially suitable inanga was found uh, quite a lot throughout the area. So at the northern tip, uh, north of Smith's Road, and within the Rapo stands that are quite extensive through the area. So really quite a lot of potential for this whitebait spawning. And this is just the areas where the yellow is, where there's potential uh, inanga spawning sites, quite high value inanga spawning sites. And then the kind of limitation is that black box where the kind of crushed culvert is, is located at the moment. Okay, so we looked at connectivity as well, so where the fish passage barriers currently are. And we just did a bit of a high level assessment looking at these, uh, these barriers and what could be done for them. So we found quite a few. There's this one here, which is Smith's Road Ford. It's a bit of a, how would you call it? it it's more topography, so it, it has a rise where the, the water can't get over. In high flood flows, there would be connectivity here, but it was dry during the time of our survey. There's also this area here at uh, beach, one of the beach access points, and including the tip, um, the culvert at the tip of uh, Rakaia Lagoon. And then there's a lot of variable topography throughout the system, which is preventing uh, connectivity during base and low flows. Uh, there's also a historic hell weird, uh, <laughs> hell weird. <laughs> there's a historic wellhead uh, that could be released as part of this program, which would provide additional flow into the system, which could improve water quality and, and flush out the systems, providing you know, just better hydrology through there and, and more water. Currently it's capped and the, the area is dry, but if it was released, it would increase the, the lagoon and wetland area quite significantly. This is just the area looking back up towards the wellhead and you can see the, the rapo just dying off naturally, but it could become a really amazing wetland habitat if it had more water. Uh, and we also did some additional fish surveys within the lagoon itself, within the Jollies Lagoon. Uh, all we found in there were native species, so long finnel, short finnel and the bullies. Uh, and many of the short finnels were migratory, so that meant that they were trying to move downstream and get out to sea to breed, but they were blocked by that culvert. They weren't able to naturally get out of there. I mean, eels will do anything to get over, and in, in a high rainfall event, they probably would move over the, the gravel bar, but they don't have a direct access to the sea. Okay, so then we also looked at the, the impacts that could happen here. So. The benefits would be fish passage for native species into Jolly's Brook, and we were focusing particularly on those uh, spawning enunga to improve white bait numbers. Uh, the migration pathway, so that's talking about the eels trying to move out and in when it's time to reproduce. Uh, Stabilising the water levels uh, so that it's not going up and down every time you open the culvert and release the flow, it's quite a dramatic drop. So if we could stabilise those water levels, it could improve the ecological functions and increasing that volume of flow. So by adding that groundwater from that capped well, we could increase the, the movement through the system. It would also supplement those seasonal flows from Jolly's Brook that are a bit lower. Uh, we'd also like to increase the rapo distribution within the whole wetland area because that provides really great habitat for not just fish, but also for breeding birds. It's really good cover. And yeah, the, the overall aim is to maintain uh, restore it to its former extent and provide that passage for fish. But then the risks, because there's always risks when you have benefits. <laughs> so there could be passage of exotic predatory fish and what we're really referring to here is the trout into the, into the lagoon. They have historically been found in Jolly's Brook system, but we currently think that they're not in the system. We would want to do some more um, surveys to confirm that, some red surveys, but currently they're not known to be there. There could also be the spread of exotic plants from, from doing the works, which would have to be uh, controlled. 
and then sedimentation from actually doing work. So if you're installing culverts or replacing them or doing earthworks to connect the two wetted areas, there could be an increase of sediment. But these can be managed during the, the construction process. And then the last one was just damage to the existing ecosystem because a lot of this area is of high value and is, is functioning well. So we would want to make sure that what is there currently that is in good shape isn't impacted. And then we also looked at the long-term security of this idea. If we were to connect them, is it, is it going to last? What kind of maintenance is it going to need? Is it, is it subject to flooding? Those sorts of questions. And we don't anticipate it to cause any issues. Uh, floods coming down through Jolly's Brook could lead to blockages of culverts, not more so than what's already happening. It's a spring-fed system, so it doesn't have a, a large amount of flooding. And then also large flood events that occur, occur through the Rakaia River could block that uh, passage up into the system. Again, that's already happening. And then looking at the long-term security and sustainability. So looking at sea level rise and extreme weather events, we don't anticipate that it would change much compared to what's currently happening. You're already going to have sea level rise issues and um, climate change issues, and this wouldn't exacerbate that, in our opinion. Um, but, but potential issues could be extreme rain events causing flooding to the farming land behind it. That's definitely not what the objective of the project is to do. So there are some options that we can look at, including overflow culverts out to the sea to make sure that flooding doesn't occur to that land. And then also looking at sea level rise causing ingress of salt water into these systems, which are mostly fresh water at the moment. Uh, but that's just looking at planting the right species that are tolerant of this and uh, potentially providing additional capacity within the system, so making it larger. And then also sea level rise causing inland migration, but there's been quite a few studies shown that the gravel beaches will erode less than the sand beaches. So again, not expected to change things compared to what's already going to change. The proposal doesn't expect to exacerbate these uh, climate change issues at all or significantly, and then just potential increasing temperatures leading to higher in-stream temperatures, but again, that would be occurring anyway, and the hope is that the increased flow coming from the wellhead would mitigate that. So what are we planning on doing next? Uh, we haven't found any major issues saying that this shouldn't go ahead. Uh, however, this is an, an initial assessment, so we need to do quite a bit more information gathering to see, how, see if we can move forward. So. The biggest one of those is consultation. Uh, we're trying to consult with the, the locals at the moment and get your input into what you would like to see in this area. Uh, but there also needs to be a lot of consultation with local iwi, dock, fish and game and the councils just to get everybody on board and, and make sure that there is active communication. We also would like to do an updated brown trout spawning survey to see if they're or still in the system because connecting them could lead them to go into the system. If they're already in there, that changes the, uh, the impacts of that. And again, yeah, consultation with fish and game because it could impact sports fishing in the area. We would also like to do an, some more comprehensive plant surveys on the threatened and at-risk plants in the area, bird life, uh, herpetofauna, so lizards, frogs, and uh, pest plants. So yes, as I said, doing an assessment of lizards in the area using those uh, beach um, rock systems and a hydrological study. We really need to do a hydrological study to look at flooding issues and how much capacity needs to move through the system. And yeah, looking at what kind of minimum levels are required in the system to maintain what we're trying to maintain, that passage through the system. And then, yes, that hydrological study will also determine the required excavation depth to connect those two systems. Okay. So just to provide some visual ideas of what we're thinking here, we've provided some master plans, which are just at the back there, a bit easier to see. They'll come up on the presentation, but on the A2s, the A1s, uh, it's a lot easier to see what we've proposed. One on the left down there has the existing environment, what's there, what are the barriers, and the one on the right is our concept of what the area could look like. So we want to enhance that existing ecosystem. It's already really good down there, but how can we make it better? Provide uh, that fish passage, provide mahingakai opportunities, uh, maintain those existing access points, because we know you guys really want to be able to have that access down to the beach for vehicles, 
There's currently a few access points. We're proposing one more and enhancing what's already there. So we want to make sure that that public access is available. We've also proposed having a boardwalk along some of the area of the hapua with some platforms and signs talking about the heritage of the area and the ecological values. Uh, we would like some public education opportunities, which is why we'll have those boards on the boardwalk, and then also allow those northern reaches to remain relatively inaccessible. So that's talking about the Jolly's Brook end, because it would be good to keep that a little bit protected for ecological reasons, so that it can be used by the bird species that don't like a lot of human interaction. Try and keep them undisturbed if possible. So trying to balance that public access and seeing what's happening and, and the improvements and also keeping it uh, safe and protected for the environment. So as I said, the ones down the end are a lot easier for you guys to view. It's a little bit hard up here on the screen. You can't read the words. But this is the existing, the existing state. Uh, so this is one of the culverts that's there and the existing wetland areas, the photos up there. And you have just the key explains all of the different areas on the map and the colour coding. But then we have another one which is the concept plan of, of what we would like it to look like and this is where we'd love some, some input from, from everybody on what kind of uh, features you would like to see, what you don't like, what you do like. Uh, and this has, so there's a bit of a concept picture up the top there of what we're thinking with the habitat and the boardwalks and the access accessibility and then down the side a key with all of the different habitat types we'd like to enhance. So yeah, much easier to see them on the pictures down at the back, so we can go gather down there and have a look after the presentation. Okay. So I'll open it up for questions of what you guys would like to know. Thanks, Laura. It was really yeah. entertainment. Um, my first question is, so where the wetland is, how many landowners actually own that area, or is it not owned by anybody? So where the wetland is now, how many properties are involved with that? There's, yeah, I wish I could bring up a map and show you. There's quite a few properties along the, the landward side, yeah. but the wetlands themselves are mostly in the coastal marine area. Okay, so can, maybe Winston can confirm so that. We'll take her off mute. That. Take that's you off mute that. now, Winston. She should be right. So, so, who does own that? Is that the regional council or the district council? Or? So it's Crown owned land, um, but it's managed obviously by regional council. Yeah. through the coastal plan provisions. Um, yep. and it would be part of the more comprehensive planning strategy of, of who's owning these lands and getting everybody on board. Yeah. So we did an initial site walkover with all of the affected landowners in that area, or most of them, just to see what people's thoughts were and get them in, involved in the process. But for example, I mean, that where the wellhead is, there's that area that could become a wetland and part of the system that is privately owned. <laughs> Sorry. I should keep my mouth shut. <laughs> so, if, if you were to use the well head, so I assume that's also Crown own piece. I believe that's on private property. Can you confirm, Winston? Um, sorry, it's coming in and out a wee bit, so I only caught a little bit of that. Sorry. Is the well heads on private property? Yes, it is, um, yeah. but it was volunteered by a landowner to um, uncap that. Okay, yeah. so. I'm just thinking about, you know, once, say, say everybody went, yeah, yeah, this is a great idea and we'd love it to go ahead. So who ultimately would be the people taking care of it, I guess? Long term, my gut would be the regional council. Mm. Yeah, but there could be some custodian caretaking by the Eastai group or the local iwi mm. community groups, that sort of thing. But regional council would maintain that. So to use that well here, or is it pump or artesian or? I believe it's artesian. It's an artesian well, isn't it, Winsome? And, and he's capped it because of flooding issues, but will release it if the proposal goes ahead because it will have an outlet, so it won't flood his land. That's, land. that's, that's what I understand. At the moment, um, it's not in use and there's no uh, outflow options for it. So in order for this to go ahead to be uncapped, we would have to provide an outflow for it into the um, lagoon, yeah. So, so once it's uncapped, it, its flow rate could be quite varying, depending on seasons? Yes, yes, and it could be potentially manipulated based on hydrology assessment to 
kind of work out what kind of flows the system could take and set a minimum flow, maybe. <laughs> that would require further assessment for sure. So in terms of like yeah, trap, yeah. So I always like asking this question because the whole idea is that we're trying to instigate the native fish to rejuvenate. Mm. How, how big a threat do you think brown trout is to decimating or reducing the natives that we're trying to help? Yeah, that's, it's, a, it's a tricky question and it's one we'll have to pose with Fish and Game and Dock because the intention is to improve the native fish passage up into the system. If we, if we had to put, in, in, in particular Inanga, trying to get them up there to spawn, if we put a fish passage barrier so that trout can't come in, then we're going to stop native fish coming in. So it, it, from our investigations, it's an all or nothing type of a situation. We can put a fish passage barrier there and preserve the system for native fish only, but they'll have to be, eels will be able to come out of a one-way outlet, but we won't be able to provide ingress in. So it would have to be designed for non-diadromous non native fish, the ones that don't need that sea, sea life cycle stage. And that's not really the intention of the project. So from, from my kind of gut feeling is that it, it is an all or nothing situation and trout were historically in that system. So it's going to be a decision from all of the stakeholders, including yourselves, on what kind of values you want to see in Jollysbrook, f fish um, species-wise. We'll be trout on there. Yeah, they'll just be <laughs> hiding from us. <laughs> exactly. So we've, there's, there's heaps of old, uh, old reports and old surveys. Uh, Winsome actually did one years ago with her old company where they did find a lot of brown trout and lots of reds but there's been a lot of silt deposits in Jolly's Brook so we wonder if that's slowed down the reproduction of trout in that system but I don't doubt you that they're in there. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> You're not yeah. catching any? Yeah but that rafu and that, none. Yeah. That rafu and that, the trout won't go into No we don't think so it's, that, it's not that, ideal that, habitat that, for them. It, it's definitely more suited to the native fish than the yeah. trout, so I don't see it being too big of a concern, but again, it will be something we'll have to work through with, with the trout other stakeholders. Trout and are virtually extinct. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, That's a shame. Yeah, okay. Well, look at the well, netting we're doing. You can't catch one. I know. There's been very extensive netting going on, and, and there haven't been any. Oh, oh. In the last 10 years? Yeah. But what? The last five years? Well, we're trying to find yeah. that out. Yeah. Uh, we've just been doing the netting. I've been part of that smelt program with Marty Bonnet. And yeah. He came in. We've been doing a netting from the first week of September to the 31st of March. We do it every two weeks. Yep. And we do it right from one end of the. It's the, very, uh, very right intensive. The south parts to the north parts. Yeah. And we do it with bloody great nets. <laughs> and uh, look, if we can get one trout on, you know, most of them are only young ones. Mm. So. It's, it's about the habitat, that's what we're looking at, you know, Marty knows what we're looking at, the stones, what's what's causing everything. And yeah. we've looked at everything, white bait, bullies, everything. So everything we see, has it changed? Yes, it's certainly mm. changed. So white bait. Oh, yes. White bait. But in our surveys, we haven't found, uh, haven't found those white bait in Jolly's Brook because they're not getting up into it. They can't get in there. So that's really the driver for this is they can't get up the culvert, they can't get from the rakaia. They they're, used to get in the culvert when it was open. They, yeah, they could get in then, but it's so infrequent that it's not a reliable way for them to get in and then nothing can get out. So that's the real issue. No, and they also have a very short life cycle. Yeah. So they only live at most three years. Um, so there's not a lot of opportunities for them to get in and their ingress migration season is very short as well. So if you don't have that culvert open when it's their season, they're not getting in that year. Yeah, right. Have that happen two years in a row and you've lost yeah. all of them. Yeah. Yeah. And the all smell too. I know. It's a stalking show. I know. Yeah. Just like laying anything, what about the sea rat, the sea rum and trout? Yeah, what, are, what are they? Yeah, exactly. I've got no idea. They are. No, well they used to be, they used yeah. to be, not no longer. No. There was always, there were always a lot of local trout, and, and you can tell the local ones because their scales are uh, closed up and, and they've got all those colours. The sea runners are all silver, 
you know, uh, we get the odd one. I, I, you see on this report, it's going to come up, you know, very, very few. And very low. That we've got. Now that skinny, that there's no way in hell the eggs will be able to produce. So that's what we're looking at. You know, I, I've been doing it for three years, so. I've <laughs> got it done through. <laughs> through no food. Hey? There's no food. Yeah, that's the trouble. The smelt, the smelt kill the birds, they kill everything. Yep. So if we drop the smelt, everything does. That's how good it is. I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully that study will shine some light on what's happening yeah, in the system. Yeah, it's good that it's true. happening. Yeah. So, even if it was a open access into Dolly's book and trout dotting, you don't think they might be an issue anyway because they don't breed like that sort of water. Well, as long as, you do, as, long as there's weed there and cover for the native fish, the they can't get it. Oh, okay. You know, it's like the lagoon. There's a lot of weed in the lagoon there. Well, the shags can't get them. The, the premises can't get into that stuff. Do you understand? Mm. It's their hideaway. Especially so those big rapo stands. Oh, yeah. Know. We've gone and had a look, and you know, that rapo is full of it. You want, isn't it? Great rearing and yeah, yeah rearing yeah, habitat for the young habitat. fish. Yeah. And the trout won't go there. No. <laughs> Have you seen the impact on the level of Jolly's Brock? Um, effectively, you're going to do some, um, you have to work out a pool to go. Yes, yeah. Um, that's not effectively going to pull the plant, is it? Because the more water in Jolly's Brook, the better the stream health. Definitely, so, yeah. Um, that will be the next phase hydrology assessment, just to make sure what we're proposing doesn't do that, because that we don't want that to happen at all. We don't want to, we don't want to make Jolly's Brook worse by making the Harpua and Lagoon better. The intention is to have it all working as one system, and there may be scope to add in a bit of a. Um, I'm not a hydrologist, <laughs> but a way of keep maintaining that. I'm not aware because that'll block the fish passage but there's ways of maintaining that and having maybe more of a uh, skinnier way of getting out to the harpoa and that's what the hydrology uh, team would look into is making sure that doesn't happen. We talk about um, in the article in the paper we talk about increased volume are we talking about increased volume to Jolly's Brook are we talking about increased volume to um, the piece that runs behind the sea bank from the well cap? That yes that's what we were referring to so we don't want more water coming from Jolly's Brook into the area but there's this other source of, of water coming from the wellhead that could be brought in to increase that volume and, and get it moving through because currently it's getting quite backed up and, and potentially flooding land so this would be to maintain movement through it while also uh, providing resources to have those wetlands thrive. How, how far would it get tidal? Currently, there's no tidal influence in that hapua, correct, Winsome? No, it wouldn't be at the moment. No, not at the moment. If we opened it up, the, the, the Rakaia Lagoon in that corner isn't very... It's yeah, pretty it's fresh water. Yes. Yeah. What happens is the lagoon gets a barrier, so it goes along, and when it flows out the river, there's always the beach that's in the there. Yeah. It maintains the level of the lagoon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of, for the water to get back up there, it's quite a long way, yeah. If the mouth was a lot closer, mm. maybe. But, mm. The mouth uh, is, yeah, down the other end, so yeah, it protects it from way. that saltwater intrusion quite a lot. We've got money now to open it in here, if you have to. There's a fund by you can actually open the mouth if you need to. Mm. I just, while I'm here, I just wanted to read an email that I received from Graham Patterson. He apologised that he wouldn't be able to attend the meeting, um, but he is a resident at Little Rakaia House, and he wanted to tender his wholehearted support for the proposed oh. opening reinstatement of the fish, fish passage from Rakaia Lagoon to Jolly's Brook Wetland. He's seen historical photos of the stream and its junction with the lagoon. The proposed opening would be reinstating a natural passage that existed some many years ago. I'm sure it will enhance the future of both the wetland and the Rakaia group. So yeah, it's just good to get feedback from everyone if they're supportive of it, because um, then we can take it or to not. the next step. <laughs> yeah, or not. <laughs> yeah. Do, does anybody have any reservations about how it would impact you, or as, as you're all kind of local landowners? I know, I know a, one particular concern may have been beach access. 
because you don't want us making it all a lagoon and stopping you getting onto the beach, but that, that's definitely not the plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just the main concern would be what just I said about pulling up five on Joy's Brook. We don't want any less fly on the narrow ends. So no, it's a nice uh, flowing system. You don't want to. Okay. Yeah, they put the rock, the rock band in the end so that it maintains it. Just to be over. Yeah, yeah, just to yeah. so The form's massive or something, and all the pressure behind Joy's Brook goes, and then it just goes to nothing. No, no. It's not going to be helping the fish stream out the end thing, so that's, that's a what. Concern. Yeah, that's why I want to make sure we get the hydrology study right because we need to work out yeah, how much flow is coming from jollies, how much is coming from criers, how much is coming from the wellhead, how it will move through the system and also require how that would influence it backing up. So that's a, a vital part of it, of maintaining the, the good values that are already there because there are some really good values in that system already. We don't want to damage that. Do you know if they actually do flow checks on that? Oh, I'm not aware of it. Uh, I think it's actually the one on Acan's mapped off on another creek, but um, yeah, yeah. they do come and check, I think. But it's as far as actually checking them out on them side. No, we used to do the water testing years ago. Yeah, I think. But, well, um, I never did any flow checks, I'm just wondering whether you were aware of any that's all. No, I think the one on the website, I think, is um, down off another creek, but I think they do check it periodically. Are you sure there's a stage height recorder, isn't there? Down at the main bridge? Mm. We can look into look into that. Mm. <laughs> um, just in relation to um, the creation of that passage through, um, I, I'm just wondering whether under extreme uh, ocean events whether the sea ever does breach over the beach and whether there will therefore be an occasional maintenance issue like if you open yes. up the passage is is it likely at times to get smashed over and, and filled up and having to be dredged out again? Potentially there is anecdotal evidence that during very high flood at very high rough seas you know big storm events there can be overtopping of the beach into the the existing hapua. Mm. So that would be, as Hamish was talking about, considering what those ongoing maintenance requirements are for, for planning reasons, but also for budgetary reasons, uh, because somebody needs to get in there and, and, and clean it out. Yeah, that is, it is a potential. That was looking at that long-term sustainability uh, of, of the proposal of, you know, is it going to become a coastal saline wetland at some point? Um, also, I just had a sort of planting question. Yes, go. <laughs> um, when, when we were flying through, because I'm not so familiar with that area, when you, we were flying through there, there was sort of taller vegetation through the lagoons. Mm -hmm. it wasn't, um, I was unclear as to exactly what that was, whether that was the Elisma or whether it was Raupo or whether it was... It's Raupo. Blows. It's yeah. Raupo, isn't it, uh, Winsome, that large vegetation in the middle of all of the wetlands? Uh, yes, I think it's in the middle of a dieback because it tends to die back out of season. So it's quite quite brown. I don't know if you saw when you're flying across and you think, oh, it doesn't look great. It's all <laughs> brown and looks like it's dead. But Rapo undergoes a natural seasonal it's system. Yeah. yeah. So it's all, all Rapo. There's quite mm. dense stands in there. Mm. Sure. Mm. No, I can see. Imagine that. Mm. And um, I guess there has been some sort of botanical survey done all through there. Yes. Yeah, so there's there's been the. I mean the high level ECAN mapping surveys and then we just looked at the pest plant so that would be the next stage is doing a botanical survey and, and like really habitat mapping so you can, can do a before and after kind of survey and looking for those rare plants, the threatened species because we, we did a kind of high level walk over looking for pest plants and nasties uh, but that's not our specialty so we didn't want to wade too far into there. Yeah obviously before any earthworks or anything like that are done mm. and you'd want to make sure there's nothing in the path of that. Of course, mm. yes. Anyone else got any questions? <laughs> no, I was just thinking about, so in the future, because I, I quite like the idea, and it would be cool to have somewhere for people to go as well, as mm. also the natural side of things. So in terms of getting support from the district and regional council for the maintenance and the yeah. ongoing stuff with it, um, you guys haven't ventured down any of that yet? Yeah. Not, not yet, only that there's already existing maintenance of, yeah. of the, the culvert out to the sea and also the culvert down at the end of the lagoon that 
it's not a lot of maintenance. Uh, so it would require probably, it's hard to say at this stage, once we did the hydrological study, we would know a little bit more about what would be required. Uh, but no, we haven't talked about that, just had high level conversations about um, the project in itself and what they would want to see. Oh, the water currently, <laughs> it must leak through the... There's, there will be some shingle. leakage through the shingle, but not a high level. Because otherwise it would just keep filling up. And it doesn't. I just asked a historical question, and so we're really saying what, what used to be there. So, how long did coal have been there? Why was coal put there instead of carrying on with what naturally shouldn't happen? Uh, is there anyone laying over to that could answer that question? Not, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I would think that it probably did connect at one point, but it, it, when you look at the maps, I can probably get it back up, but there, there was that skinny little band where it went around, went around sand hills and it probably naturally drained through the system, through the, the gravel and then down into Rakaia and then just as things have changed and silted up and that passage has just reduced over time. So they put in, it was in the 1930s, they put the culvert out to sea and it was probably to drain the system so that there could be more farming closer, to be fair, but I don't know that. Yeah, it would be great to get a bit more history of the system. But I, I would think it was probably to drain the system a bit more and contain it. Bit of land <laughs> acquisition or something. I, I don't know, though. All right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, no problem. Laura and Hamish and... Winsome. Winsome. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, it's really good to see your faces. So we will be updating everyone on... Um, our website and in the local press um, and I'm sure any of you that saw the advert have, you've got my email now so if anybody wants to contact me afterwards with more questions then I'll happily pass them on to Laura <laughs> and Winsome and they can answer yeah. them for you.